watched the last episode, you'll know what we're after. I'm Jason Phelps, and I'm here to notch a tag on a public land Idaho bull elk. But along the way, I want to share some hard-earned lessons that I've picked up over the years. On this trip, I'm joined by Garrett Bowen, a longtime friend and great caller. He's hunted this unit before, but not in a little bit. And I'm totally new to this particular area, so we are a little unsure exactly where the elk will be. There are a couple major elements that will affect this hunt. Firstly, the full extent of the rut hasn't hit its peak. Bulls aren't quite as aggressive or as vocal as we'd like, but they should still be responsive. And secondly, we're on public land with general tags here. So hunter traffic could impact where we're gonna be and where the elk are at on the landscape. So that bugle we just heard, he's slightly downhill and probably straight across this drainage from us, 30, 400 yards. We haven't called to him yet at all, so. Probably have to head down just to keep our wind going down the drainage a little bit. Straight up. Then we'll start with cow calls on him, see how he reacts, and then we'll switch it up. It's kind of. We have a mix of country to cover here, from sage in the bottoms to dense forests up high. This hunt takes place between 7,000 and 9,500 feet in elevation. As anyone with even the most basic understanding of hunting big game will know, good scouting is imperative. We're dedicating the first few days to reconnaissance, figuring out where the elk are at, what the wind is doing, and how other hunters may be affecting their patterns. Almost got the wind right for you. We're okay. We're about on it. You want to get up? He's every 30 seconds. Pretty vocal. Oh, yeah. Leave them alone until we get close. <laughs> yeah. We're going to start with cow calls. This is a great low impact way to trigger response, especially since the rut just doesn't seem to be kicked in yet. Those bulls just kind of—they don't like cow calls, evidently. I guess not. He was in a pretty good yeah. day, and then he saw him just push off. Yeah. Okay. Most ground you. The rain definitely affects elk movement. In this mountainous terrain, more often than not, you'll find that they tend to stop moving and bed down to ride out the storm but there have been a few times where the rut actually picks up with the rain. So we're gonna keep on hunting. You know what they say, practice makes perfect, but I've done a heck of a lot of practicing and I still manage to screw things up every now and again. Heck, I even forgot to bring my tag for this hunt. Had to drive back down to town to get one. So here we are, taking a couple practice shots during a midday lull. I highly recommend it. Evening 
has us heading the other side of the drainage. There's a lot of sign here in the timber, but a lack of significant vocal response has us digging for a new plan. aren't getting us responses so we keep moving. We're looking for that one bull that is ready to play the game rather than trying to force something. Donated tonight to uh, scouting. Had some pre recon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna do a th three day spike over across the drainage, and so we decided to come over on this side and donate tonight to Glass and look like we located at least, at least one a, elk. Yeah, at least a elk that looked like a bull. Yeah. Um, but we got a pretty good plan of attack for the next three days. It's the weekend, so uh, rather than try to maybe hit some of these easier elk, we're gonna dive deep for three days and try to get away from the people. So, we're in them today too. Yeah, yeah. I think there's enough to keep us busy for three days. I know after cow calling today, we're definitely switching to bugles tomorrow, see how that works. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, They're not fans of the cow calls yeah. yet. No, I'm go get some food, pack some gear. Food, get all our stuff packed up and ready for tomorrow. Cali home. Day two, Idaho. We are seven mate, miles in. Seven, <laughs> maybe half a mile in. <laughs> but uh, five thirty in the morning, our plan was to get in here about three miles. But we've got bugles up the creek ahead of us, so we're gonna and, slow the pace. Yeah, touch. slow the pace, kind of figure out where they're at, stay below them, and probably make a play on them before we finish heading to camp. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense to just walk past bugling. Elk. No. Just no. in case there's not a lot of bugling. Elk. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we're gonna just slow down, listen, figure out where they're at, and then make a play on them this morning. Our plan is to go in here for three days, two nights. Sounds good on paper. We'll see how good it really pencils out here once we get up there. But I think it sounds really good. <laughs> Way colder this morning. Yeah. Clear last night, no clouds. Yeah, froze. Everything was froze at camp. The bulls should just be a ripping this morning yeah. till about 8 15 <laughs> and they go back uh, don't say that i hope yesterday it was like nine o'clock they were done yeah yeah they didn't be after nine not a single one strange creatures so yeah we'll just mosey up here so i'll keep listening <clears throat> and see if we can find. he's up there ways oh he's up there ways. <laughs> yeah Just pick our way up the trail and see if we can't hear him pop off again. We quickly dropped our camps and we're now working to get the wind right as we head towards a pole that's been bugling all morning.
Calling in tandem is a very effective way to get bulls excited. While Garrett rakes and calls, I continue to move closer. The noise and commotion adds realism and it helps to disguise my movement. As we continue pushing, my calling gets more and more aggressive, pressuring the bull into making a move. This bull isn't going to give up his position, we just aren't close enough. I need to be more aggressive and push forward toward the bull. Garrett will stay in position to continue calling and raking. I'm going to get as close as the terrain and vegetation will allow. I can now see the bull up ahead. He's about 120 yards up on the ridge line. There's about a 50 yard flat that separates the steep section that he's on and the steep section that I'm on. I decided to become even more aggressive with my bugling and finally see the bull break in my direction. I'm thinking that is all the calling that I'll need to do. But the bull bugles at me again from 70 yards out. So I pick up my bugle tube for one last bugle to let him know that I was planning on finishing what I had started. He approaches to my left and then stops at 15 yards. He's almost straight on and looking for the elk that had just bugled at him. I draw my bow out of his sight. I'm focused on sending the arrow through the center of the vitals, which will have my arrow entering just on the quarter two side and exiting on his opposite side. The frontal shot is one of my favorite shots and when executed properly is very effective. How'd it feel? He's got a huge blood spot behind his shoulder. It looked good. Nice. And <clears throat> towards the end he started to run really fast like he was struggling to get up that hill. I saw some antlers running off. So I shot from where, yeah. I shot from right there. He was literally yeah. underneath that lean, like a 15 yard shot. Um, hit him just Chance. right at the frontal and he's got a big blood spot coming out right behind he the shoulder. Up the hill? Yeah. But you're mugging. Yeah, I mean, he's got okay. four inches behind his shoulder. It came out, so it's a little angled. Oh, well, that's perfect. But you should have clipped. You know, at the end, he started to like run really fast. And yeah, so it took looked good. Yeah. And I did watch him, so I wanted you to kind of see what I, he kind of right where these big three furs are he kind of zigzagged and then at the end like he started to get like going really fast but we'll see good bull five by six good frame cool. 
even when I know I've made a great shot, it's important to give an elk 45 minutes to an hour before picking up the blood trail. The last thing I want to do is bump a wounded elk which can result in not recovering the animal. But based on this blood trail, the shot seems to have landed well and I'm very confident we'll find this bull. It went in a little left. Bleeding out of his chest. Went, yeah. yeah. Went in a little left out of his right. And if he's bleeding that bad out of the front, he's in trouble. Yeah. Actually, he's scrambling blood out here. Is that him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's him. <laughs> He's been there the whole time. It was like 30 yards from him. <laughs> it's good. You always want to take your hour break 35 yards it's from the take It's good to take it. <laughs> oh, goodness. You know, it's crazy. You get you get good tags and it just seems it's unfortunate but like you put extra pressure on yourself right you're like got to come through or got to find something big yeah, and I think giant that's kind and, of a given with those tags it, and uh it takes a little fun out of it so it was fun to just yeah. have a general tag get up in the mountains get, stretch the legs there was out. no pressure up here it was yeah. we found some elk yesterday and we knew we were kind of yeah. wanted to start and then loaded the backpack gear up and yeah. here we are yeah, it's nice to find elk that like to be called to and don't run the other way yeah or, that, that's been yeah that does help. Thank you, man. Thanks for calling. Great bull. Yeah, thanks. Now, you, now you're up. I've shot bigger bulls, but this one was awfully fun. It's a respectable 5x6 on public ground, in the mountains with good friends. What more could you ask for? With the warm midday temperatures and a pack out ahead of us, I'm opting for the gutless method today. Absolutely. The first step of which is to open up one side of this bowl, starting at the back and exposing the front and the hind quarter for us to debone. How far up do you want your back strap? Just where that when it splits about 50-50 with that other neck muscle, that's yeah. no longer back strap I usually use. Yeah. How big a cut that broadhead does to the tip of the heart. <laughs> Once we're done with one side, we flip it over and start on the other. With the trail not more than a couple miles from here, our pack out isn't going to be that bad. Everyone has a favorite cut they like to cook up in celebration of filling a tag, and I'm no different. So you're making your favorite camp meal. I'm gonna make my favorite camp meal, one of them. See who's better. All right. no, I'm sure they'll both be great. We'll cook off. So you're, what are you making there? You've I got a tenderloin so far cleaned up and split in half. Split in half, a little bit of cream cheese jalapenos then wrapped in bacon. Normally you do this thing on like smoker, the Traeger, let the old Dutch oven panel work. And I'm going with a beer battered heart, similar to like a fish and chips, a little bit of bisquick, a little bit of beer, so and try to keep our heart chunks fairly thin. You don't, want to, yeah, you don't want them to bleed out too bad. And then just salt and pepper.
hearts your favorite or the tender one? Man, it's close. The heart's just so mild and so tender when you cook it that way, but um, man, a tenderloin this way is amazing too. Yeah. You They're can't both, really go like, wrong with you don't cook, anything. you don't you can't overcook either of them. Yeah. Yeah, like heavy on the rare part of medium rare. Yes. Very good. Yeah, we both have rifle tags coming up, so uh, hopefully we get a few more hearts and a few more tenderloins out of the deal. I'm ready.